So, Alexander Wolf played varsity basketball in high school and later was a club team in Switzerland. He earned a BA in history from Princeton where he later taught. He spent 36 years at Sports Illustrated. He filed from the Olympics, the Soccer World Cup, the World Series, every Lent, Grand Slam tennis event, so that sounds pretty sweet, <laughs> and the Tour de France. He has traveled to China, Cuba, Iran, and covered issues at the intersection of sport and society, including race, ethnicity, gender, drugs, and armed conflict. He's the author of four of the seven books about basketball, and he edited and introduced a collection of basketball writing for the Library of America. Two years ago, he published a book called Ten Papers, A Family Story of Books, War, and Escape and Home. And that explores the lives of his grandfather and father, both German-born men who became American citizens. And there are copies in the back. Who will be speaking to our guest? Lindsay Sarah Gosnell. Lindsay Sarah Gosnell holds a BA in International Affairs, an MA in Journalism and French Studies, and a PhD in History. So she covers the gamut. Uh, she's taught courses in global sports, sports diplomacy, history, writing, and international affairs at numerous, way too many to list, uh, public, private, and government institutions. She currently lectures on sports and diplomacy at the Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sport at New York University. She's a men mentor for the Sport Integrity Global Alliance an editorial member of the Sports Law Policy and Diplomacy Journal, and a member of the Overseas Press Club of America. Outside of her consulting practice, she's the founding director of France and Us. That's all strung together. It's, it's hard to say it as, as you see it, um, which is just what it, it says. It's in France and the US and um, sports. And she's written about global sports for The Athletic, The SPN, The Washington Post, The New Yorker, and others. Dr. Pasma served as a historian in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Public Affairs. And um, she was advising communication strategies and then uh, public history storytelling content. Her book, Basketball Empire, France and the Making of a Global NBA and WNBA, is her second book following um, uh, the, the Making of Les Bleu, Sport in France, 1958 to 2010. So, basketball, history, global connections, issues, I bet. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Liza. Um, you don't need a reintroduction, but since I'm engaging in conversation, maybe I should just briefly explain how it is that, um, how delighted I am to see that this book has, has come out. One of the other books I wrote, uh, way back in the early 2000s, was a book called Big Game, Small World, which was an attempt to throw a canopy over basketball globally. And somehow, <laughs> I neglected to devote a chapter to France. And now, France is the country that is producing what other, other than Canada, I guess, more non-American players in the NBA. And any other, does that go for the WNBA too? Uh, France only um, has sent a similar ratio of players to the WNBA as to the NBA all time, um, but I don't know if they are the premier pipeline of non-North American players to the WNBA. Okay, well in any case, I mean, <laughs> A huge impact, and one of the teams in the finals right now um, has a guard from France. So, um, but particularly because Lindsay has this background that, that Liza described that is so ranging journalist, historian, diplomat. Um, I just can't think of anybody who operates in this space or any space that has quite as broad a remit as, as she does. So, this book just landed um, with uh, it. it Put a smile on that face when it landed. And uh, but I've also heard you talking about this over the years, and it was a work in progress, and probably wouldn't have been as auspiciously published if it had come to be any sooner than it has, which is kind of paradoxical because we authors always are 
crazy to get our words out there, but can you talk a little bit about the journey to publication? And yeah, that's a, I think a really great starting point. And thank you for that really lovely kind of tee up because I've been thinking about this project and talking about this project for years. Um, certainly really first inspired in 2013 when France won the European Basketball Championship uh, for the first time ever. And I was then stationed in Paris and we're working on a global one project for the US Embassy in Paris, which really kind of centered on um, the individual relationships that American diplomats had forged with the French communities and which they were posted in terms of explaining why US diplomats did perhaps a lot more than just a neutral country in the first years of the first uh, months of World War One. And I remember watching this basketball championship and seeing that, uh, that championship team, which just over half of the players had some kind of US experience, most of it NBA experience, whether they were currently Van Frank in the NBA, Tony Parker, or Stiao, um, or had previously played in the NBA um, in the early 2000s, Mike Jalabal, uh, Mike. Uh, a few of the, uh, the Pietras brothers, one of them had played, um, Nando DiColo, who was also with the San Antonio Spurs. And I remember thinking, was there some kind of correlation between the way that you explore yourself and that you improve your own abilities by being in a very different environment? In this case, the players being overseas in the United States, was there correlation with what I was working on for work um, 100 years earlier? And that was kind of the, the origin and story of this entire book. And the short answer is yes, it's all about the individual ties. Uh, but the process for publication was not perhaps as easy. It's a very niche topic. And initially, it was a much narrower focus, with a focus just on this question of how and why did France send so many players to the NBA? And what does that mean? How does it impact the game? And while I started doing the research and started doing some of the interviews, I was not getting much of any data in terms of publication uh, agreements with um, his own uh, publisher. Uh, so it was a stop and start affair for several years. During the pandemic, 2020, 2021, I dusted it back off uh, with a much broader kind of conception of what it should be. Yes, it should be about this question with the NBA, but it should include the WNBA as well, as well as the NCAA, where there is, uh, since 1984, a fairly constant wave of French players coming to the United States, whether at Division I, Division three levels, up and down. Um, and also um, broadened it to include the African connection. So it, uh, and I was talking with Louis Ferry last summer he signed the publication contract two weeks before Victor Wambanyama had his kind of breakthrough performance in Las Vegas with his French team last October. And, you know, very much to your point, timing is everything. And this book, if it had come out even a year earlier, would not have had the same, I think, impact. Um, it also would have been it's still slightly different. Uh, and, uh, particularly as we gear up for the Paris Olympic Games next summer, where the Olympic basketball tournament is going to be one of the most watched parts of the competition uh, globally, particularly as many U.S. Uh, uh, stars are coming out of national team retirement. Um, it's going to be a much more interesting uh, basketball journey over the next several months than you know, anyone could ever have intended. Yeah, I mean, maybe the the thing that wasn't so auspicious was that France didn't do better at the FIBA World Cup. Uh, but the fact that the U.S. also got eclipsed by Germany at that competition means that there's this parade of, in the name of patriotism, this parede of NBA's players who want to redeem yeah, redeem themselves. And at the previous uh, FIBA World Cup in 2019, it was France that knocked the United States out of the competition. Um, France went on to take third place, uh, but you know, in the years since then, there's been an evolution of 
trash talk between some of the U.S. Uh, national team players and French players during the NBA season. And I take that as, for them, a badge of honor because if the U.S. players didn't care or didn't feel not threatened, maybe that's the not to not the respect. Right, exactly. It's a certain degree of respect. So, <laughs> well, so one of the things that we've talked about in forming the team has been this whole idea of basketball is it a game or is it more than a game? Mm -hmm. And I've heard from you the suggestions that it's become a kind of cultural movement in certain parts of the world, and certainly in the U.S., you can see whether it's street culture, fashion, music, there's so many instances of that. And I just wonder whether we've reached a point now where we can say it's the same in, in France and, and in other parts of the world that are under the influence of French culture. Mm -hmm. I think that is a fairly fair assessment that basketball is more than a game. Um, it's an education tool. Uh, you can get into that part of its DNA. Uh, but also, it has become a movement, and I was actually on the phone with a French journalist earlier this week uh, who was talking about a new series that they are launching every week um, before it keeps moving into the Olympics next summer. And the main star is basketball, the movement, not just the game, but everything that goes around it. So uh, it's a very fair assessment. Uh, so among those things would be because I've always, I've always, maybe this is an older generation of French people, but I've always thought of them when they regarded American culture, pop culture, and you could say that basketball and these byproducts are mm -hmm. pop cultural things. They, they regarded it, you know, as kind of an arched eyebrow and the, the sort of Parisian of that, you know, just, and I, I just wonder now, is it confined mostly to a certain generation of French? They now take it more seriously and embrace it, or is there still sort of that lingering? So those who consider basketball a movement, it is, I think, a generational cleavage. However, French have been playing basketball for generations, and some of the, the, the stories that are featured in Basketball Empire are from those who were playing in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So kind of, um, I think of the, you know, the that certain generation you might be thinking of that would have a kind of a disdain for American popular culture. You know, um, they are perhaps some of the most ardently pro-American cultural um, proponents, uh, which is which is kind of interesting because one of the subtexts of this entire story is the historic and cyclical uh, French and American uh, mutual admiration and disdain for each other going back to the 1770s. I mean, this is not new. But what we see in basketball is it's kind of augmented a little bit um, in that in the, in the, really in the 1970s, once we start to have more American players come to play, regularly to play, um, there is a fear of an American colonization of French basketball courts. Not that basketball is a terribly big sport in the same way we're used to here in the United States. In France, historically, it's taught in the schools. People play it; they know of it, but it's never been mediatized. It's what we call, um, or what the French call, a closeted sport, a hidden sport, because it's there, it's known of, it's played, but it's not part of the media culture. It's not part of the consumer culture, um, and so there's always been that distance. One of the things that's been so much fun to watch in this kind of global embrace of basketball, and this is happening, in France is happening all over Western Europe, is where once Americans, as Americans are wont to do, we thought we were the great civilizers, we would go abroad and we would teach the benighted foreign how to do these things that we do so well. So the State Department would literally, for whom does it work, would literally send coaches overseas and it would be like paid development workers and they would teach the drop step and how and would come home and speak to other coaches, say, yeah, they're, they're okay, but they're kind of mechanical. And then things happen, like um, the, the U.S. gets upset in a major competition, or satellite TV happens, or these things happen, and suddenly the basketball knowledge and wisdom starts to flow in the other direction, you know, which happens in so many other 
not just in sports. But boy, has it happened from basketball. And, and it's something that, um, you know, if you're a French chauvinist and you want to embrace basketball, why not embrace Tony Parker and the idea that, or the San Antonio Spurs who, you know, whether it was Parker or Boris Diaz, they're two wonderful French players on that team who were both better passers than you could find practically anywhere else in the United States. And they were produced by the French system. <laughs> Yeah, very much. It, and that's, I think, one of the interesting things that's chronicled in the latter parts of the book is that the once you have this kind of two-way exchange of players with the same technical know-how, you're starting to see some interesting evolutions in within the NBA, not just in terms of its culture and how some of the French players have introduced French rap and hip hop in locker rooms. Um, one of the uh, one of the French rookies who's playing at Portland, he had to do a um, kind of a rookie stand-up um, skit uh, in front of all their fans earlier this week. And he sang along to one of the French rappers that he's taught his new teammates. Um, and they loved it. So, you know, this kind of cultural transmission is also happening, not just on the game side. And I think I totally went on a sidebar from your original question. No, that's not what's <laughs> That, that, that speaks directly to it and actually kind of circles back. You know, we, we were just talking about Dia and Parker, and now with, with Victor Wemby in San Antonio. I, I did want to talk a little bit about the Spurs because there's something just remarkable about what, what you just described, which I love the fact that you pulled it out of the news, like literally the last week. Mm -hmm. um, that is what I, I, I believe is sort of the key to the success of the Spurs. It's, San Antonio is one of those rare teams that's been able to sustain, sustain success over really almost two decades. And, okay, you can say, what are the constants there? They had Tim Duncan there for a long time, and they've had Popovich, and they have a very hands-off owner. Can anybody in this room tell me who the owner of the San Antonio Spurs is? Okay. Can anybody tell me who the owner for a long time of the New York Yankees was? You probably all know the name of that guy. Right. But... You know, that's my point, that their owner as the wizard just step back and let people who know better do it. And they created under Popovich this really remarkable team culture where he would encourage players to be exactly what you just described in the Portland locker room. Um, he had a, an ab Aboriginal point guard from Australia who was actually, his mother was one of the lost generations of Aboriginal children was actually taken from her family and placed in a white home and to kind of uh, reach her into the general population of Australia. It's one of the most shameful chapters in all this Aussie history. And um, at the same time, another one of Patty Mills's ancestors uh, was the actual litigant in the famous land rights case in the Torres Strait Islands that led to the whole idea that land in Australia Australia could be traced back to deeds to the original indigenous who occupied that land, which is just a total revolution in Australian law. And Patty's story, Popovich recognized, was so, so meaningful to him that if the rest of the team knew about it, it would cause sort of greater level of enlightenment throughout the locker room, and that there could be real team bonding over. And it's that kind of um, excitement about the potential of creating the, the kind of micro community and what it could mean for togetherness on the basketball court that I think helps under, underscore what's going on here. Very much. And so the very interesting trick of, you know, incidents um, or really great circular story for that is this culture that has been built at the Spurs, which is pretty much become ground zero for some of France's most well-known players in the NBA. Arthur Diao, Nando Nicolo, Gilbert, and now Wapanama, and Sidi Sissoko, who was also drafted um, and is uh, on contact with them. Is that so it's a culture um, of embracing kind of the international and making it very much a part of the family? Victor Wapanama's paternal grandfather played with a very similarly orientated club in France back in the 1960s at the University Club. Um, there is an excerpt kind of um, 
but there's an excerpt uh, that ran in the athletic earlier this week on kind of one snippet of why this club was so open to outside influences, not just that they traveled extensively as part of their still amateur status. They played all over Western Europe. They played behind the Iron Curtain. They traveled to Moscow on several occasions throughout Africa. Um, but they also embraced international players, whether they were part of the American kind of um, flux uh, who early Americans really marked that, that team history, or whether they embraced uh, migrant uh, players from West Africa, from then the empire, then shortly thereafter, the former empire, who had come to the French mainland for their university studies and wound up playing basketball in some, uh, some way, shape, or form. Not all of them were actual basketball players at the get go. So, um, it, it's an interesting kind of nice symmetry as storytellers. We like having those really nice anecdotes to be able to kind of book any things. And so with the Spurs, certainly um, there's that nice uh, back story for one by one. Yeah, and, and just the fact that the team with so much historical success would somehow wind up with the number one pick. The fates were working overtime to make that happen. Um, yes. But, um, yeah, and so much of, of what we've been talking about just now has pertained to, um, uh, or examples of, you know, I want Lindsay to talk about sports diplomacy, this wonderful phrase, and it's the space that she's made her own. But these individual connections that are made, that um, really it's people to people. Mm -hmm. Sports diplomacy is so much more individual people interacting and having these very meaningful experiences and I'm, I'm reminded of the most famous sports diplomatic thing ever was supposedly was ping pong diplomacy and that was the result of this wild haired crazy uninhibited American hippie who just sort of forced his way onto a bus of Chinese ping pong players and started introducing himself and there was all this media coverage of it and somehow Mao saw the clippings and had this moment where well this is only the natural order of things. We should pursue this. So it wasn't, it didn't begin in this ministry and that ministry and cables being sent, you know, over the ocean. It was, it was people to people. But what, what is this thing, sports diplomacy? Sports diplomacy is kind of a newer phrase from the ages old uh, act when the, the actions of diplomacy, communication, representation, negotiation, intersect with the sports world or around the sports world. And when you think about it, you know, even if regardless of whether or not you are one of the world's best ping pong players or basketball players, um, even if you're at say amateur status, if you, you know you, you communicate, represent and negotiate about your home your home, about your home culture, your views, uh, about your different identities, it's naturally the course of engagement and feelings with your teammates or in competition. And so that's what sports diplomacy is. It is a people project, and that's how I started thinking of it very much. It's an investment in people. Um, and usually we see these acts of diplomacy occurring through cultural, technical, or knowledge exchange. And so the example of Ronnie Parent rapping and introducing his, uh, his US teammates to French rap um, last week, uh, that's an example of cultural exchange Technical exchange. Um, we have a few examples of that. Uh, the infusion of the Euro step into the NBA. Um, fellow Vermont uh, born coach will avoid uh, taking some of the proclivities of his Angolan basketball players and using that to create a new defensive system that he's then been teaching to others uh, around the world. Technical exchange, a knowledge exchange, um, exchanging the how to, right? Uh, whether it's upskilling knowledge of how to you know, improve science around the game, whether it's the knowledge of how to market the game or how to better create young players, uh, that knowledge exchange is another example of it. Yeah, I, the Euro step is such a wonderful example. It's exactly the thing that those, you know, back in the 1960s, those coaches and state departments sent overseas. Um, they weren't teaching that. <laughs> they were screaming that that's travel. <laughs> that's what they were doing. And now, 
people who don't want to use zero step because it sounds a little too cosmopolitan call it the step through. I think that's the, when you hear somebody calling it the step through, definitely they don't want to say zero step. I think that's that's the the lesson of that. Um, yeah, and your passion for this. Um, I know you worked in the State Department as a historian. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where is the combination of, of your experiences that led you to this? And, and obviously, French studies, part of it. Oh, yes. I am a terrible basketball player. So it comes nowhere from that. Um, I'm a swimmer, and I'm a skier. I can do both things recently. I'm terrible at basketball. Um, but uh, so it really comes from when I went to graduate school the first time, I wanted to be a sports journalist. And so I did a program training in sports journalism, and it was a joint program in French studies. And in order to get out of there, I need a degree of uh, success and quickly, uh, I had to do an investigative series of journalistic um, pieces looking at sport and France that had to be French and sport. And at the time, it was right after France won the football soccer World Cup in the European Championship back to back. And my starting question was then, how do they make les Bleus? How do they make French soccer players who go on to win major international tournaments? Um, that became the backbone for my dissertation and first book. Uh, but I also, not just soccer, but I focused a little bit on basketball at the time, mostly because that was part of what I was finding in the French government archives. Not that I was finding tons of it in the general French press, but it was in the archives and it was accessible. And knowing an American audience might find that a little bit more relatable. I included a kind of a little bit of basketball in that. Um, when that came out, it was what, 2000? Well, it came out much later than when I finished it. Um, I finished around 2008, 2009. And at that point, Tony Parker had started to Know, um, make a mark on the NBA, but you know the, the story was still a bit in its earlier, earlier um, phases. Uh, and so when I started looking around for my second project and had these kind of origin story ideas and questions, it kind of all made sense. You know, I, I do remember after France won the '98 World Cup, there was, I think, great hope among optimists and that that some of the tensions in French life over immigration might be mitigated. What, how did that work out? And is basketball sort of getting another bite at the apple for that? It didn't work out. <laughs> um, uh, but what it did do is, um, I think, further highlight that 21st century France is truly global in terms of demographics and nature and uh, the stereotype that I think so many people have of the guy with the beret and the baguette and the little bike, that's very outdated and has been for quite some time. Basketball, I think, is also helping to push the envelope um, in France in terms of, you know, broadcasting or representing a full 21st century France. And I think part of this also gets to the fact that basketball in France is seen very differently than soccer. So yes, we've, we've talked about how soccer is king, it's the most commercialized, the most visible, but soccer, which was the first professional team sport in France in the 1930s, has always been looked down upon by the opinion-making elites as you know, with some degree of disdain because in French culture and sports culture, it was always about the Olympic ideals of amateurism. Um, even though those were not country. So playing sport for money had kind of this taint of capitalism to it. The French are still a very socialist oriented country. Um, and so for those reasons, um, French soccer, it was always, it was the sport of the working class, the immigrant classes, even though everyone watched it, everyone kind of hated it, everyone consumed it. Basketball is the sport of the bourgeoisie and the elites. Um, because it wasn't a professional endeavor until the 1987 season. So it's not like, unless you're an American, it's not like you can make any kind of money playing basketball in France until after 1987. The Americans were paid a bit under the table and there, you know, some, you know, um, team housing that was provided, travel, that sort of thing, but you couldn't really make a living if you were a French person. 
playing basketball until after the full professionalization of the sport. So that helps to explain a little bit the different kinds of outlooks towards the two sports. Bringing it back to, well, why, you know, why when you look at who plays basketball in France, it is, again, one of the most broadly diverse um, demographics uh, in all of France. Um, most of the players look at pretty, pretty well, pretty benevolently. They're, you know, especially on the women's side, regardless of where their families once upon a time came from, um, they are very assimilated into French life. Most of them are French citizens, um, second third generations. Um, you know, they, they kind of adhere to the ideals of the Republic, which in France confers certain degrees of respect and um, you know, accommodation. And the footballers, the soccer players, because of that taint of, you know, the sport being of a different class, there's a lot more criticization and a lot more difficulty with it. And quite frankly, up until recently, you know, none of the politicians really cared about the national basketball teams, we'll be honest. So you're getting a taste of why this book is so richly contextualized, because Lindsay just, she knows her plants cold and she's layering all of this history and culture um, over and under the, the sports stuff. Um, so you, you said that it was originally a very bourgeois sport. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, but not today, really. It's more sort of the sport of the, the banlieue, right? The... Well, so that's the interesting thing. It is still, when you look at where basketball is played, it's still, out, with the exception of Paris and the greater Paris region, region it's still a sport of the provinces, the smaller and medium-sized cities, um, and whoever lives there, which is at this point quite mixed. Um, but in Paris, it is a very, um, it can be a very urban sport, um, especially with the outdoor playground, uh, basketball courts, um, and you have a mix of pretty much everyone playing. Especially, and that started to change in the 1980s and 90s as we had the movement of effectively what we would know as street basketball. And the players who would play on outdoor court to outdoor court to outdoor court in Paris, they would travel in from the banlieue, so the, the less prosperous um, out uh, suburban areas. They would travel from some of the more prosperous areas of the city if they were really you know, a, um, a basketball player. Um, and it was a, a so, so it's been around for me, um, it was a, a melting pot of people on these uh, ball courts. Yeah, I know that was absolutely a conflict for me, a really representative. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the paradoxes in French life is that um, a lot of the racial diversity, ethnic diversity in France is actually in the suburbs. We think of suburbs in the US as, as being uh, populated by largely white people who left urban cores, but it's a little bit inverted. And, Certainly in the Parisian region. Um, I, for people here, I, I feel almost like throwing it open to questions and then we can come back to our conversation if the questions start to die down. But I think you first want to have a QA opportunity if anybody wants to jump in. I found in your book the different stories that you wrote about the different players that you selected. Um, many of them have generation, second and third generation players. Mm -hmm. He wrote mothers and fathers, mm -hmm. which I find fascinating because obviously there's, there's a continuity in culture that um, would have been carried through on the sport. Yeah, they go into the family business. Yeah, exactly because of their passion, <clears throat> not because of any need. And I think that's one of the really interesting parts that comes out. So there's a, a, an interplay in the book between for CL, um, 14 season NBA veteran and uh, champion of the deck, Sarah Henry Spurs, and his mother, um, who in her own right was a basketball legend in the late 60s and 70s. And you know, he, both of them, because I interviewed them at separate points in time, they both tell the story of how you know, the, Boris and his brother were never pushed for basketball. Uh, the mo um, their mother, Elizabeth, was just very hands-off, wanted them to find their own way, wanted them to do what best suited them. 
and boys came back to basketball regardless of that. He did a lot of other things too. Judo, rugby, photography, many other things. But he came back to basketball was his passion. So yeah, it, it's very much a lot of the players, even Juan Banyama, this very generation basketball player. His mother was a player and still coaches. His father was, uh, grandfather was a player. Yeah, it's really isn't it interesting how it crosses the gender lines too. And I'm very friendly with a Dutch journalist whose wife was a player on the Dutch national team, and she has remained great friends with Elizabeth mm -hmm. Boris's mom. Um, said that she was just this kind of free thinking, um, passionate about sport. And Boris has tried to thank her. I think once by buying her a fancy car, and she just had no interest in her son buying her a fancy car, which I think kind of underscores what you've been saying about how it's about passion mm -hmm. and not professionalism. Right, yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's, it's so great you've already read the book here. See, I imagine people coming into a reading and then all of a sudden, oh, I gotta read that book, I'm working out with the book, and going home and reading it. And here you've come here, the book's only been out. Oh, okay, <laughs> excellent. Um, yeah, any other That's so cool. So I, I, I wonder how long the supremacy of the NBA is going to last, given the international nature of the game. Mm -hmm. now. I mean, when do you see something happening outside the U.S. that would be worthwhile? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so Euroleague is what we're strong this year. There's been talk about an expansion of the NBA into Europe, and uh, I, I've heard rumors of, although I have no way to substantiate it, maybe Alex, you might know more, that um, at one point in the not super distant future, you have the NBA in North America, you have its um, version in Europe, whether it merges with your league or not to be determined, and then the NBA basketball action. And you know, the ultimate championship, at least on a professional level, would be between the best teams from all three leagues. Whether that's rooted in reality or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'd say about 15, maybe 20 years ago, when the Stern was still alive, you could have heard that floated a lot around their Olympic Tower offices in Manhattan. Um, I think now with climate change, Yes, you could you could see a kind of playoff at the end of the seasons of those three leagues, particularly the African League raises its level high enough. Um, but the thinking in the NBA office now is very much, the, oh, we have these wonderful technological ways of delivering our product to every corner of the globe. And if we tip off in this time zone, this time, you know, breakfast in Tokyo, and people can watch on their phones as they commute to work on the bullet train, and at the same time, you know, with the West Coast, they're perfect for evening viewing. So one game delivered to this amazing global audience. So you don't have to have, like, the Amsterdam ants playing at the Utah Jazz or something, you know, and burning all this jet fuel in the process. So I think that's the way with virtual reality and all sorts of new bells and whistles. The NBA is thinking about these ways of delivering the product, creating new fans, it's one of the reasons that I think they've been so shrewd in sharing highlights. Anybody can share a highlight clip. And they're not going to sick their lawyers on it. Because they think it just grows and they sell more t-shirts. Well, but for the moment anyway, and please jump in here, I think that players everywhere want to play in the NBA. It's the pinnacle. And, and there's no other league really that rivals it for prestige, for upset, for salary. Not taking the issue, but, but I said, okay. No, I, I would tend to agree. Um, but I was going to add on, you do see the NBA um, doing more and more of their global games. So one in season um, game overseas, it's been in the past few iterations of the return in January. And right now, several of the teams are finishing up their preseason overseas games. Madrid, I think it was this week, last week was Abu Dhabi. 
Did they have Mexico City this year or not? Usually, like sometimes they also go over the coach and whatnot. So, you know, trying to deliver a little bit of the in-person experience just before the season kicks off. Um, so those are exhibition games. What are they marketing? I don't think there's any real comparison. Um, so there is a financial cap um, for uh, the professional teams in France, and I think Monaco, uh, they just published the number today. Two of the that are affected. So Monaco um, is the team with the highest um, salary related budget. They also have to sign Campbell Law, so we will start with them. Um, and next after that is Oswald, Kenny Parker's team, and they're kind of the outliers at the very top, only for some of the best players um, to come and play. No one else can match that financially, um, so it's you know, pretty much a, there's no comparison. Perhaps this helps to better illustrate it. One of the bonuses for French clubs who form so if you invest in and develop this young talent that's then drafted by the NBA, uh, when their young players sign their first NBA contract, the NBA um, reimburses the French club for the expenses um, in developing them. And well, it's kind of transfer. Um, a few years ago, so at the time that I had the hard stats for the book, it was about $675,000. It doesn't sound that much when you talk about professional basketball here in the United States or professional you know, men's sports, but I mean, that was oftentimes you know, a big lifeline for clubs. Uh, the club where Victor Juan Banyana and Joel Kulibaly played last season, Mets 92, in the outskirts of Paris, they got you know, twice that amount because they had two of their young players um, drafted and signed by the NBA, but they almost went under because of lack of fiscal solvency. So they're on the lifeline right now. So I think that maybe helps you contextualize the significant differences that are there. And a lot of it gets to that issue that you know, basketball is just not a development event. We spoke fairly more recently. They lack a major <coughs> television broadcast contract, which would help with some of this. So. Yeah, the, the NDA is such a huge global footprint that it now, like in China, the Chinese National League has this terribly hard time breaking through because the, the biggest fans of NBA basketball are the Chinese, and they, you can't fool me, is what they say. You can't foist your, this National League on me. I, I've seen Kobe Bryant, and I know how good he is. And I, I think that's what's going on in yeah. France to some extent. Yes, yes, for sure. You know, and if, if this guy playing for some provincial team in France isn't in the NBA, they know. If he were really good, like Tony Parker or Boris or or Pitt Cruz, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering, too, Lindsay, what might have caught you by surprise as you were working on this book? Because you, I mean, this is a subject that you really made your own, but those aha moments and research and sometimes. So that's a great question. Um, I actually asked this of a French journalist I was interviewed by this morning, who's an expert in all the current day stuff. Um, you know, had battled his way through the whole book in the second and third of them. I was surprised me most. He said, first half of the story half was I didn't know the way out of that. So for me, I think one of the real aha moments was how much Bill Russell influenced the early kind of revolution of the French game. Even though he probably had no idea he had that kind of in, impact or imprint. Um, there's three different kind of um, strains of Bill Russell to be found in the early part of the story. One from an American who goes to France and the fields, and that's part of the excerpt in the athletic suite. Um, uh, Henry Fields um, you know, worked to bring and you know, introduce Bill Russell's style of defense and tactics. Uh, to France, where he wanted to create the U.S. coach. Did it. Um, the other strand comes through one of the um, stars of the French game in the 1970s and early 80s, Jacques Pantaleon, who grew up in Guadeloupe, 
um, and it has these really great story of how you know the, the family for um, um, growing up there was an American institution nearby that would offer um, cookies and milk and a piece of cheese that made the neighborhood kids would come in and you know, it was a way of luring, luring them in and then trying to have them read some of the American books. It was there that he discovered a book on Bill Russell on the same American Institute the film of Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics and that ignited his desire to emulate Bill Russell. And he'd go out on the basketball court and practice moves so that he could do the same moves that he saw Bill Russell doing on this, probably at that point, somewhat outdated tape. Um, and throughout his professional career, this one player, Jack Cashmere, wore the Bill Russell style beard. Uh, and, you know, as a tribute to his idol. <laughs> Uh, and the third strand actually comes through Boris Nia's mom, Elizabeth Griffier, who didn't grow up playing basketball. Uh, she was very tall, and uh, as part of um, French basketball's desire to be competitive um, in the mid-1960s, especially with the rise of very tall players coming out of Eastern Europe, um, they started a national campaign to identify tall adolescents, tall teenagers, and recruit them into the game. It's called Operation Grand High, Operation, um, you know, height, big, big height. And one of her high school um, coaches, uh, you know, said, hey, we've got this really tall young woman. I think she'd be great for the game. So Elizabeth Griffier was recruited to play basketball. She started playing when she was 16. She was tall for the game. Um, but she had something um, and was taken under the wing of the then women's national team coach who had her training, she did a lot of individual training, but also had her start watching tape of some of the Celtics mid-1960s NBA um, playoffs and finals. And she would just watch, it was probably just one tape, right, when you think of how, how much more difficult it would have been in the 1960s to get your hands on green tape and watch it. Uh, so she was watching tape of Bill Russell and was told to work on the technique and her defensive moves so that she would learn to play defense like Bill Russell. Um, and so that is in part how she wound up being the first uh, French woman to land a one-handed jump shot. <laughs> and the only reason she initially agreed to speak with me for the book is because I wanted I asked her about Bill Russell. So that is the reason I've agreed to speak with you. Because he is my hero, my idol, and I get so emotional talking about him. I really don't want to talk about myself for my career, but I'll talk about Bill Russell. So that was kind of the entry point, and then I got this really great story out of her. So I think the Bill Russell kind of legacy and connection was uh, my biggest aha moment because I knew that you know there was the connections between the two countries and the people, but you know to have um, particularly growing up in Boston area, to have one of our you know, legendary players have such a huge imprint on this story um, was a very nice circular, uh, for me, it circular. It sounds like Elizabeth Riffio, I've, I've heard these stories about how, what an independent, free-thinking woman she is. It sounds like her personality was a little bit influenced by Tola Bobosa, too. And the fact that she was moved, it took you invoking his name to get her to really open up. Yeah. It's pretty Great. So th th those are great. They're, they have a little local New England connection, but there, there's also a little Dartmouth connection too, isn't there in the book? There is. Um, so one of the more interesting stories is that of Crawford Palmer, who um, first went to Duke and played you know, with Coach K uh, on one of those uh, early, early uh, teams, and then transferred to Dartmouth uh, because he wanted to focus on his studies rather than only with the basketball. And so played with Dartmouth, graduated from Dartmouth, and um, didn't quite get the invitation into the NBA that he had been hoping for. And the phone call he did get one summer was to go play professional in France in the uh, mid-1990s. And he said, sure, why not? Uh, Crawford Palmer wound up obtaining French citizenship through marriage, he married a French woman, and through that was eligible to play for the French national team. He asked him um, if he would do national team service. Uh, and 
he said yes, because he didn't think his uh, chances of getting asked to play for Team USA were, were terribly good at that point. Sometimes it comes down to a, you know, a desire to play at the elite level. Uh, then he chose to play for his new country. Dr. Palmer wound up playing for the gold medal at the 2000 Sydney Olympic Games, where by weird coincidence, France wound up um, you know, contesting the United States in that final gold medal game. Everyone expected it to be a blowout. But um, ultimately did not win. It was nowhere near as close as the Olympic final in 2021. Um, but uh, there's this great story of Dr. Palmer saying it was kind of surreal to be on the medal podium getting the silver medal, being really proud of you know my, my other country, which was getting the gold medal, singing both national anthems, being friends with some of the guys on Team USA who we had gone to high school with. Um, and so I think a, a really nice story of the interconnect between the two. It's great to see you living in France. Oh, I'm glad you were still in France. His two kids, I think, came to college in the US. His daughter was the winner of the French version of the board. I think both the kids also played basketball. His wife is a former basketball player. How did you select which play to so the play was featured in the book by the ones who said yes when I asked if they said <laughs> uh, So that is why there is not a separate chapter on Tony Parker. I did ask several times over many years. I never had a response. And you know, sometimes that's just how it is. Others said thank you for the, you know, thank you for the inquiry not now. Um, and others said yes. So uh, the, the voices featured in the book are the result of who said yes, but also especially for the more historic part of the book, it features the players who have had maybe not the biggest star turn in France, but those who were, you know, amongst the Americans, perhaps the most emblematic of the transatlantic migration of players, um, also the ones that they get to. It started with um, Martin Feinberg, um, who was pretty much the first American to impact French basketball after 1945. Uh, he arrived in France in 1954. Um, I tracked him down uh, thanks to the archivist of the French Basketball Federation. At that time, uh, Martin, after many decades living in France, had just moved back to the US. So he was willing to talk and interview him a few times by telephone. And when I explained the early origins of the story uh, and you know, how he was also looking at the earlier connections of Americans who went to play in France, he said, oh, you should talk to some of the former teammates of mine who are still in France and who went on to help create the game or the youth development systems that are today producing the NBA players. And so they were still interneted enough. So that was in one part how I found them. Um, once I had names, uh, the archivist again was very helpful at helping to facilitate um, initial outreach and queries uh, for the more recent players. It's been the, um, thanks to the um, cooperation with the, there's a network of former French internationals. So we played for the French national teams, men's or women's teams. You're part of this network, and uh, they've been also helpful in supporting access for the project. You know, sometimes um, getting the marquee interview I found over the years is really overrated. That th the donut kind of tells the story of the whole a little bit. Yeah. And, and it sounds like where there's real value in, in your, your book is this setting the context, telling the story, filling in the blanks. Who are these? Unsung heroes who actually help with the fire. Um, I, all of this makes me hope that the book will find um, a French edition. Is that a possibility? <laughs> they are meeting about that next week. Um, I know that's part of the plan to, to have eventually a French language edition. 
uh, but that is out of my hands. That is in the hands of my good publisher. <laughs> but I'm guessing that a lot of this that you've collected is stuff that hasn't been gathered in one place in French land. Correct. Correct. Questions? There, there was one, growing up I used to read a publication called Basketball Times, this tabloid thing that would come out more frequently in season than out. Didn't cover the women's game much, didn't cover the international game much, but there was, I remember one story about an absolute sensational French women's player, Jackie Chazelle. Mm -hmm. And she was Pete Maravich before Pete Maravich. She was this, she played on this club team in the middle of the country called Clermont Ferrand, and they won five or six consecutive French mm -hmm. titles. And she was just a blur, fabulous dribbler, behind the back passes. Um, and everybody loved basketball, I loved Jackie Chazelle. And I just wonder if there was a, if she was like a comet going across the night sky or whether she really fits into the whole story. She does fit into the larger story in that um, when she was at Clermont, uh, she would uh, kind of interact and uh, practice a little bit with some of the men's team players who were there, some of which were American, so you know, she would integrate a little bit some of those styles of play. Uh, one of her, one and a half at least, of her coaches at Clermont were American Skill Sweet, coached at Clermont for a season before going on to coach um, Elsewhere, um, including in Milan, um, and uh, he, yeah, um, and then the third connection to the story for Jackie Chazelon, who's one of her very good friends in the late nineteen seventies, is an American um, then coach and player. Um, he went on to be the sports information director over at uh, St. John's University, Carmine Calzanetti, and so. Carmine and Jackie actually uh, co-created the first Jackie Chazelon basketball camps in France. And I think the first one was in 1976 or 1977. It was the first ever American-style basketball camp in France. And one of the early MVPs was Vincent Collet, who is currently the national team coach in France. He coached Victor Wambayama last season. He was the coach who helped to roll Nicolas Batum before he came to the NBA. Same with Frankie Makina. Um, another one of the Jackie Chazelon camp MVPs over the years was Tony Parker. So, you know, it, it's got this interesting kind of mix. And the Jackie Chazelon camp would bring in coaches from uh, the US. It would also feature some interactions unfold with. For example, the Senegalese women's national team came in and did some drills with the, with the campers, um, as well as French players and others from around Europe. Um, so, you know, it's, it was this interesting kind of culture of different basketball styles. And I think it is also important to say that while the book focuses on kind of the French and American and um, French African uh, nexus of basketball, there's not this, these um, kind of um, migration patterns that influence French basketball. There's also some Eastern Europeans and other who came in, whether it's players or coaches, um, but perhaps not as large an impact as the U.S. Uh, culture. So I, that, that three-pronged test that you said about sports diplomacy, how it can be technical, how it can be sort of content mm -hmm. or style, it sounds like Jackie hit on at least two of those because mm -hmm. the whole concept of basketball camps with, through her work with Carmine, she, mm -hmm. they were able to establish that. And then you know, whatever, it was that Maravich style, whether she learned it from Americans or she helped popularize mm -hmm. it. And, it, it, and, and maybe the third part also applies to her in some way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so she and Carmine actually cooked up the idea of those camps when they were doing an exhibition uh, for Claremont um, in Senegal. Yeah, do we have a one last question? Maybe we'll allow some time for someone. Yeah. I'm curious about the development of the sport in the United States. I'm curious if like, the government wants to do a top up program for that. How many will be decided in the US? And can the US collect top production players? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think this speaks 
kind of the, the question of how do they make the players. Um, the U.S. system, as you know, is pretty much a little cat talk. Yes, through the schools, um, but also through local club teams. Uh, oftentimes, if you're playing at a certain level or want to be playing at a certain level for your travel teams, and that's when we start to get into the high cost of pay to play um, that can be um, a, a deal breaker uh, for some kids whose families might not have the means or the ability financial or also the time. Um, and that's across the majority, I think, of the American um, youth sports landscape, more or less. Uh, in France, it's very different. Uh, the government provides, uh, so the local clubs are not private clubs, they're community clubs. And so they're, you, know, you can participate in there. Um, but in order to participate in a sport, regardless of whether you're eight years old or 80 years old, you have to have a license. And pretty much it's um, literally a piece of paper um, that officially registers you with your sports uh, national federation. And what it does is, you know, it also is a way for them to ensure that everyone who's playing with the club in some kind of formal um, structure has the medical clearance to do so, right? Um, and, uh, but also it allows them to help to figure out numbers and then resources and other resources. So. Um, for example, if you are playing basketball, I think right now the yearly license for basketball costs is about 250 euros, which sounds steep, but that's all you pay. Everything else is provided by, you know, by, by the club. If you are good enough to be selected into the federal um, training um, centers, uh, then everything is then covered uh, at an elite level. Everything is covered by the basketball federation, whether it's regional clubs or the elite, kind of the apex at the top of the triangle, and it's elite sports school with Penny Parking or Seattle. Um, if you're the other track, you're quite good and are so, uh, recruited by the professional teams into their youth academy, again, everything is paid for, um, as well as your school in both tracks. So, it's a very different kind of system where even for those families that might not be able to afford the yearly license fee, there's usually some kind of subsidy that will do it. For soccer in comparison, the yearly license fee, I think right now is about 100 euros. So it provides a great, usually greater opportunity and access for youth sports. Um, and one thing that the, you can argue pluses and minuses of both systems, um, but I think one thing that the French system has done well in basketball in particular, as well as soccer, is they have created a network of almost kind of scouts, right? They call it detection. They go out and they detect promising youths and they recruit them into the various different um, training tracks and they blanket the territory. Um, and you can see that in terms of the kinds of outputs that they have um, in these sports are also very good in detection and recruitment and um, rugby and fencing um, and a few other sports as well that are really well known for having kind of mastered that detection um, system. There are players who escape the system mostly because whoever is scouting them um, maybe you know, doesn't have it quite right. Rudy Gobert is perhaps the most recent example of um, uh, when he was young, he was overlooked by the system. Um, no, they're, they're, you know, he was not recruited into the elite system or what kind of had to really fight his way into the youth academy at the level. So it's not it's not cool proof, uh, but um, it does go out and protect a lot of players. Yes, thank you so much.